We hope you enjoy hearing this classic book reading by Alexander Scorby on our YouTube channel. To hear more, click the playlist link in the description box below. Please subscribe, like, and share the link with others so they too can hear Scorby's classic book readings. Bad the Kaler, and Bin Bad the Quailer, and Lin Bad the Yaler, and Zin Bad the Flailer. When? Going to a dark bed, there was a square round Zin Bad the Sailor, rocks, orcs, egg, in the night of the bed of all the orcs, of the rocks of dark in bad the bright daler. Where? Hmm. Yes, because he never did a thing like that before, as asked to get his breakfast in bed with a couple of eggs since the City Arms Hotel, when he used to be pretending to be laid up with a sick voice, doing his highness to make himself interesting to that old faggot Mrs. Reardon that he thought he had a great leg of, and she never left us a farthing, all for masses for herself and her soul. Greatest miser ever, was actually afraid to lay out fourpence for her methylated spirit, telling me all her ailments. She had too much old chat in her about politics and earthquakes and the end of the world. Let us have a bit of fun first. God help the world if all the women were her sort, down on bathing suits and low necks. Of course, nobody wanted her to wear <laughs> I suppose she was pious because no man would look at her twice. I hope I'll never be like her. I wonder she didn't want us to cover our faces. But she was a well-educated woman, certainly. And her gabby talk about Mr. Reardon here and Mr. Reardon there, I suppose he was glad to get shut of her. And her dog, smelling my fur and always edging to get up under my petticoats. Especially then. Still... I like that in him, polite to old women like that, and waiters and beggars, too. He, he's not proud out of nothing. But not always. If ever he got anything really serious the matter with him, it's much better for them to go to a hospital where everything is clean, but I suppose I'd have to drink it into him for a month. Yes, and then we'd have a hospital nurse. Next thing on the carpet, have him staying there till they throw him out. Or a nun, maybe like the smutty photo he has. She's as much a nun as I'm not. <laughs> yes, because they're so weak and puling when they're sick. They want a woman to get well. If his nose bleeds, you'd think it was all oh, tragic. And that dying-looking one off the South Circular when he sprained his foot at the choir party at the Sugarloaf Mountain the day I wore that dress. Miss Stack, bringing him flowers, the worst old one she could find at the bottom of the basket, anything at all to get into a man's bedroom with her old maid's voice, trying to imagine he was dying on account of her to never see thy face again, though he looked more like a man with his beard a bit grown in the bed. Father was the same. Besides, I hate bandaging and dosing. When he cut his toe with a razor, paring his corns, afraid he'd get blood poisoning. But if it was a thing, I was sick. Then we'd see what attention. Only, of course, the woman hides it not to give all the trouble they do. Yes, he came somewhere. I'm sure by his appetite. Anyway, love it's not, or he'd be off his feed thinking of her. So either it was one of those night women, if it was down there he was really, and the hotel story... He made up a pack of lies to hide it, planning it. Hines kept me. Who did I meet? Ah, yes, I met, uh, do you remember, Menton, and who else? Who? Let me see. That big babby face. I saw him and he not long married, flirting with a young girl at Poole's Miriorama, and turned my back on him when he slinked out, looking quite conscious. What harm? But he had the impudence to make up to me one time. Well done to him mouth almighty in his boiled eyes of all the big stupos i ever met and that's called a solicitor only for i hate having a long wrangle in bed or else if it's not that 
It's some little bitch or other he got in with somewhere, or picked up on the sly, if they only knew him as well as I do. Yes, because the day before yesterday he was scribbling something, a letter, when I came into the front room for the matches to show him Dignam's death in the paper, as if something told me, and he covered it up with the blotting paper, pretending to be thinking about business. So very probably that was it. To somebody who thinks she has a softy in him, because all men get a bit like that, at his age especially, getting on to forty he is now, so as to wheedle any money she can out of him. No fool like an old fool. And then the usual, kissing my bottom was to hide it. Not that I care two straws who he does it with, or knew before that way, though I'd like to find out. So long as I don't have the two of them under my nose all the time, like that slut, that Mary we had in Ontario Terrace, padding out her false bottom to excite him. Bad enough to get the smell of those painted women off him once or twice. I had a suspicion by getting him to come near me when I found the long hair on his coat. Without that one, when I went into the kitchen, pretending he was drinking water, one woman is not enough for them. It was all his fault, of course. Ruining servants, then proposing that she could eat at our table on Christmas, if you please. Oh, no, thank you, not in my house. Stealing my potatoes and the oysters, two and six per dozen. Going out to see her aunt, if you please. Common robbery, so it was. I was sure he had something on with that one. Takes me to find out a thing like that. He said, you have no proof it was her proof. Oh, yes, her aunt was very fond of oysters. But I told her what I thought of her. Suggesting me to go out to be alone with her. I wouldn't lower myself to spy on them. The garters I found in her room the Friday she was out, that was enough for me. A little bit too much. I saw, too, that her face swelled up on her with temper when I gave her a week's notice. Better do without them altogether, do out the rooms myself quicker. Only for the damn cooking and throwing out the dirt. I gave it to him, anyhow. Either she or me leaves the house. I couldn't even touch him if I thought he was with a dirty, bare-faced liar and sloven like that one, denying it up to my face and singing about the place, in the W.C., too, because she knew she was too well off. Yes, because he couldn't possibly do without it that long. So he must do it somewhere. And the last time he came on my bottom, when was it? The night Boylan gave my hand a great squeeze, going along by the talca. In my hand there steals another. I just pressed the back of his like that with my thumb to squeeze back, singing, The young May moon, she's beaming, love. Because he has an idea about him and me. He's not such a fool. He said, I'm dining out and going to the gaiety, though I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. In any case, God knows he's changed in a way, not to be always and ever wearing the same old hat, unless I paid some nice-looking boy to do it, since I can't do it myself. A young boy would like me. I'd confuse him a little, along with him. If we were, I'd let him see my garters, the new ones, and make him turn red looking at him, seduce him. I know what boys feel with that down on their cheek, doing that frigging, drawing out the thing by the hour, question and answer. Would you do this, that, and the other with the Coleman? Yes. With the bishop? Yes, I would. Because I told him about some dean or bishop was sitting beside me in the Jews' temple's gardens when I was knitting that woolen thing, a stranger to Dublin what place was it, and so on, about the monument, and he tired me out with statues, encouraging him, making him worse than he is. Who's in your mind now? Tell me, who are you thinking of? Who is it? Tell me his name. Who? Tell me who. The German emperor, is it? Yes. Imagine I'm him. Think of him. Can you feel him? Trying to make a whore of me, what he never will. He ought to give it up now at this age of his life. Simply ruination for any woman. And no satisfaction in it, pretending to like it till he comes and then finish it off myself anyway. It makes your lips pale. Anyhow, it's done now once and for all with all the talk of the world about it people make. It's only the first time after that. It's just the ordinary do it and think no more about it. Why can't you kiss a man without going and marrying him first? You sometimes love to wildly when you feel that way, so nice all over you, you can't help yourself. I wish some man or other would take me sometime when he's there and kiss me in his arms. 
There's nothing like a kiss, long and hot down to your soul. Almost paralyzes you. Then I hate that confession. When I used to go to Father Corrigan, he touched me, Father. And what harm if he did? Where? And I sat on the canal bank like a fool. But whereabouts on your person, my child? On the leg behind. High up, was it? Yes, rather high up. Was it where you sit down? Yes. Oh, Lord, couldn't he say bottom right out and have done with it? What has that got to do with it? And did you, whatever way he put it, I forget. No, Father. And I always think of the real Father. What did he want to know for when I already confessed it to God? He had a nice fat hand, the palm moist always. I wouldn't mind feeling it. Neither would he, I'd say, by the bull neck and his horse collar. I wonder, did he know me in the box? I could see his face. He couldn't see mine. Of course, he'd never turn or let on. Still, his eyes were red when his father died. They're lost for a woman, of course. It must be terrible when a man cries, let alone them. I'd like to be embraced by one in his vestments and the smell of incense off him like the Pope. Besides, there's no danger with a priest if you're married. He's too careful about himself. Then give something to H.H. H. the Pope for a penance. I wonder, was he satisfied with me? One thing, I didn't like his slapping me behind, going away so familiarly in the hall, though I laughed. I'm not a horse or an ass, am I? I suppose he was thinking of his father. I wonder, is he awake thinking of me? Or dreaming? Am I in it? Who gave him that flower he said he bought? He smelt of some kind of drink, not whiskey or stout or... Perhaps the sweetly kind of paste they stick their bills up with some liquor. I'd like to sip those rich-looking green and yellow expensive drinks those stage-door Johnnies drink with the opera hats. I tasted one with my finger dipped out of that American that had the, the squirrel talking stamps with father. He had all he could do to keep himself from falling asleep after the last time. We took the port and potted meat. It had a fine salty taste. Yes, because I felt lovely and tired myself and fell asleep as sound as a top the moment I popped straight into bed till that thunder woke me up as if the world was coming to an end. God be merciful to us. I thought the heavens were coming down about us to punish when I blessed myself and said a Hail Mary. Like those awful thunderbolts in Gibraltar. And they come and tell you there's no God. What could you do if it was running and rushing about? Nothing, only make an act of contrition. The candle I lit that evening in Whitefriar Street Chapel for the month of May. See, it brought its luck. Though he'd scoff if he heard, because he never goes to church, mass or meeting. He says, your soul, you have no soul. Inside only gray matter. Because he doesn't know what it is to have one. Yes, when I lit the lamp. Yes. Because he must have come three or four times with that tremendous big red brute of a thing he has. I thought the vein, or whatever the dickens they call it, was going to burst. Though his nose is not so big. After I took off all my things, with the blinds down, after my hours dressing and perfuming and combing it, like iron, or some kind of a thick crowbar standing all the time. He must have eaten oysters, I think, a few dozen. He was in great singing voice. No, I never in all my life felt anyone had one the size of that to make you feel full up. He must have eaten a whole sheep after. What's the idea of making us like that with a big hole in the middle of us? Like a stallion driving it up into you, because that's all they want out of you. With that determined, vicious look in his eye, I had to half shut my eyes. Still, he hasn't such a tremendous amount of spunk in him when I made him pull it out and do it on me, considering how big it is. So much the better in case any of it wasn't washed out properly the last time I let him finish it in me. Nice invention they made for women, for him to get all the pleasure. But if someone gave them a touch of it themselves, they'd know what I went through with Millie. Nobody would believe, cutting her teeth too. And mine a pure foy's husband, give us a swing out of your whiskers, filling her up with a child or twins once a year as regular as the clock always with a smell of children off her. 
the one they call budgers or something, like a nigger with a shock of hair on it. Jesus, Jack, the child is a black. Last time I was there, a squad of them falling over one another and bawling. You couldn't hear your ear. Supposed to be healthy. Not satisfied till they have us swollen out like elephants or I don't know what. Supposing I risked having another. Not of him, though. Still, if he was married, I'm sure he'd have a fine, strong child. But I don't know. Poldy has more spunk in him. Yes, that'd be awfully jolly. I suppose it was meeting Josie Powell and the funeral and thinking about me and Boyle and set him off. Well, he can think what he likes now, if that'll do him any good. I know they were spooning a bit when I came on the scene. He was dancing and sitting out with her the night of Georgina Simpson's housewarming, and then he wanted to ram it down my neck on account of not liking to see her a wallflower. That was why we had the stand-up row over politics. He began it, not me, when he said about our Lord being a carpenter. At last he made me cry. Of course, a woman is so sensitive about everything. I was fuming with myself after for giving in, only for I knew he was gone on me. And the first socialist, he said he was. He annoyed me so much, I couldn't put him into a temper. Still, he knows a lot of mixed-up things, especially about the body and the insides. I often wanted to study up that myself, what we have inside us in that family physician. I could always hear his voice talking when the room was crowded and watch him. After that, I pretended I had on a coolness with her over him, because he used to be a bit on the jealous side whenever he asked, Who are you going to? And I said, Over to Flowey. And he made me the present of Lord Byron's poems and the three pairs of gloves. So that finished that. I could quite easily get him to make it up any time. I know how. I'd even, supposing he got in with her again and was going out to see her somewhere, I'd know if he refused to eat the onions. I know plenty of ways. Ask him to tuck down the collar of my blouse or touch him with my veil and gloves on going out. One kiss, then, would send them all spinning. However, all right, well seen. Then let him go to her. She, of course, would only be too delighted to pretend she's mad in love with him. That I wouldn't mind so much. I'd just go to her and ask her, do you love him? And look her square in the eyes. She couldn't fool me. But he might imagine he was and make a declaration with his plabbery kind of a manner to her, like he did to me, though I had the devil's own job to get it out of him. Though I liked him for that. It showed he could hold in and what wasn't to be got for the asking. He was on the pop of asking me too the night in the kitchen I was rolling the potato cake. There's something I want to say to you, only for I put him off, letting on I was in a temper, with my hands and arms full of pasty flour. In any case... I let out too much the night before talking of dreams, so I didn't want to let him know more than was good for him. She used to be always embracing me, Josie, whenever he was there, meaning him, of course, glomming me over. And when I said I washed up and down as far as possible, asking me, did you wash possible? The women are always egging on to that, putting it on thick when he's there. They know by his sly eye blinking a bit, putting on the indifferent when they come out with something, the kind he is. What spoils him? I don't wonder in the least, because he was very handsome at that time, trying to look like Lord Byron. I said I liked, though he was too beautiful for a man. And he was a little before we got engaged. Afterwards, though, she didn't like it so much. The day I was in fits of laughing with the giggles I couldn't stop about all my hairpins falling one after another with the mass of hair I had. You're always in great humor, she said. Yes, because it grigged her, because she knew what it meant. Because I used to tell her a good bit of what went on between us. Not all, but just enough to make her mouth water, but that wasn't my fault. She didn't darken the door much after we were married. I wonder what she's got like now, after living with that dotty husband of hers. She had her face beginning to look drawn and run down the last time I saw her. She must have been just after a row with him because I saw in the moment she was edging to draw down a conversation about husbands and talk about him to run him down. What was it she told me? Oh, yes, that sometimes he used to go to bed with his muddy boots on when the maggot takes him. Just imagine having to get into bed with a thing like that that might murder you any moment. What a man. Well, it's not the one way everyone goes mad. Poldy, anyway, whatever he does, always wipes his feet on the mat when he comes in, wet or shine, and always blacks his own boots, too. 
And he always takes off his hat when he comes up in the street like that. And now he's going about in his slippers to look for 10,000 pounds for a postcard. Up, up. Oh, sweetheart May. Wouldn't a thing like that simply bore you stiff to extinction? Actually, too stupid even to take his boots off. Now, what could you make of a man like that? I'd rather die twenty times over than marry another of their sex. Of course, he'd never find another woman like me to put up with him the way I do. Know me, come sleep with me. Yes, and he knows that, too, at the bottom of his heart. Take that Mrs. Maybrick that poisoned her husband, for what I wonder, in love with some other man. Yet it was found out on her. Wasn't she the downright villain to go and do a thing like that? Of course, some men can be dreadfully aggravating, drive you mad, and always the worst word, word in the world. What do they ask us to marry them for if we're so bad as all that comes to? Yes, because they can't get on without us. White arsenic, she put in his tea, off flypaper, wasn't it? I wonder why they call it that. If I asked him, he'd say it's from the Greek, leave us as wise as we were before. She must have been madly in love with the other fellow to run the chance of being hanged. Oh, she didn't care. If that was her nature, what could she do? Besides, they're not brutes enough to go and hang a woman, surely, are they? They're all so different. Boylan, talking about the shape of my foot. He noticed it once, even before he was introduced, when I was in the DBC with Poldy, laughing and trying to listen. I was waggling my foot. We both ordered two teas and plain bread and butter. I saw him looking with his two old maids of sisters when I stood up and asked the girl where it was. What do I care with it dropping out of me and that black closed breeches he made me buy? Takes you half an hour to let them down, wetting all myself, always with some brand new fad every other week. Such a long one I did. I forgot my suede gloves on the seat behind that I never got after some robber of a woman... And he wanted me to put it in the Irish Times. Lost in the ladies' lavatory, D.B.C., Dame Street. Find a return to Mrs. Marion Bloom. And I saw his eyes on my feet, going out through the turning door. He was looking when I looked back. And I went there for tea two days after, in the hope... But he wasn't. Now, how did that excite him? Because I was crossing them when we were in the other room first? He meant the shoes that are too tight to walk in. My hand is nice like that. If I only had a ring with the stone for my month, a nice aquamarine, I'll stick him for one, and a gold bracelet. I don't like my foot so much. Still, I made him spend once with my foot the night after Goodwin's botch-up of a concert. So cold and windy it was. Well, we had that rum in the house to mull, and the fire wasn't black out when he asked me to take off my stockings lying on the hearth rug in Lombard Street. Well, and another time it was my muddy boots. He'd like me to walk in all the horses' dung I could find. But of course he's not natural like the rest of the world. That I... What did he say? I could give nine points in ten to Catty Lanner and Beecher. What does that mean, I asked him. I forget what he said because the stop-press edition just passed. And the man with the curly hair and the look and dairy that's so polite, I think I saw his face before somewhere. I noticed him when I was tasting the butter, so I took my time. Bartle Darcy, too, that he used to make fun of, when he commenced kissing me on the choir stairs after I sang Guno's Ave Maria. What are we waiting for, oh, my heart? Kiss me straight on the brow and part, which is my brown part. He was pretty hot for all his tinny voice, too. My low notes he was always raving about, if you can believe him. I liked the way he used his mouth singing. Then he said, wasn't it terrible to do that there in a place like that? I don't see anything so terrible about it. I'll tell him about that some day. Not now. And surprise him. Aye, and I'll take him there and show him the very place, too, we did it. So now there you are, like it or lump it. He thinks nothing can happen without him knowing. He hadn't an idea about my mother till we were engaged. Otherwise, he'd never have got me so cheap as he did. He was ten times worse himself, anyhow, begging me to give him a tiny bit cut off my drawers. That was the evening coming along Kenilworth Square. He kissed me in the eye of my glove, and I had to take it off, asking me questions. 
is it permitted to inquire the shape of my bedroom? So I let him keep it, as, I, as if I forgot it, to think of me when I saw him slip it into his pocket. Of course, he's mad on the subject of drawers. That's plain to be seen. Always skeezing at those brazen-faced things on the bicycles with their skirts blowing up to their navels. Even when Middley and I were out with him at the open-air fete, that one in the cream muslin standing right against the sun so he could see every atom she had on. When he saw me from behind, following in the rain. I saw him before he saw me, however. Standing at the corner of the Harold's Cross Road with a new raincoat on him, with the muffler and the zingari colors to show off his complexion, and the brown hat looking sly boots as usual. What was he doing there where he had no business? They can go and get whatever they like from anything at all with a skirt on it, and we are not to ask any questions. But they want to know where were you, where are you going? I could feel him coming along, skulking after me, his eyes on my neck. He'd been keeping away from the house. He felt it was getting too warm for him. So I half turned and stopped. Then he pestered me to say yes, till I took off my gloves slowly, watching him. He said my open work sleeves were too cold for the rain. Anything for an excuse to put his hand in near me. Drawers, drawers, the whole blessed time, till I promised to give him the pair off my doll to carry about in his waistcoat pocket. Oh, Maria Santissima. He did look a big fool, dreeping in the rain. Splendid set of teeth he had. Made me hungry to look at them, and beseeched of me to lift the orange petticoat I had on with sun-ray pleats, that there was nobody. He said he'd kneel down in the wet if I didn't. So persevering, he would too, and ruin his new raincoat. You never know what freak they take along with you. They're so savage for it, if anyone was passing. So I lifted them a bit, and touched his trousers outside the way I used to gardener after with my ring hand to keep him from doing worse where it was too public. I was dying to find out, was he circumcised? He was shaking like a jelly all over. They wanted to do everything too quick, take all the pleasure out of it. And father waiting all the time for his dinner. He told me to say I left my purse in the butcher's and had to go back for it. What a deceiver. Then he wrote me that letter with all those words in it. How could he have the face to any woman after his company manners? making it so awkward after when we met, asking me, have I offended you? With my eyelids down. Of course he saw I wasn't. He had a few brains, not like that other fool, Henry Doyle. He was always breaking or tearing something in the charades. I hate an unlucky man. And if I knew what it meant, of course I had to say no for form's sake. Don't understand you, I said. And wasn't it natural? So it is, of course. It used to be written up with a picture of a woman's on that wall in Gibraltar with that word I couldn't find anywhere. Only for children seeing it too young. Then writing a letter every morning, sometimes twice a day. I liked the way he made love then. He knew the way to take a woman. When he sent me the eight big poppies because mine was the eighth. Then I wrote, the night he kissed my heart at Dolphin's Barn. I couldn't describe it. Simply it makes you feel like Nothing on earth. But he never knew how to embrace well, like Gardner. I hope he'll come on Monday, as he said at the same time, for I hate people who come at all hours, answer the door, you think it's the vegetables, then it's somebody and you all undressed, or the door of the filthy, sloppy kitchen blows open. The day old frosty-faced Goodwin called about the concert in Lombard Street, and I just after dinner all flushed and tossed with boiling old stew. Don't look at me, Professor, I had to say, I'm a fright. Yes, but he was a real old gent in his way. It was impossible to be more respectful. Nobody to say you're out. You have to peep out through the blind. Like the messenger boy today. I thought it was a put-off first, him sending the port and the peaches first. And I was just beginning to yawn with nerves, thinking he was trying to make a fool of me, when I knew his tat a rat tat at the door. He must have been a bit late, because it was quarter after three when I saw the two Daedalus girls coming from school. I never know the time. Even that watch he gave me never seems to go properly. I want to get it looked after. When I threw the penny to that lame sailor for England, home, and beauty, when I was whistling, there is a charming girl I love. And I hadn't even put on my clean shift or powdered myself or a thing. Then, this day week, we're to go to Belfast. Just as well he has to go to Ennis, his father's anniversary, the 27th. 
It wouldn't be pleasant if he did. Suppose our rooms at the hotel were beside each other, and any fooling went on in the new bed. I couldn't tell him to stop and not bother me with him in the next room, or perhaps some Protestant clergyman with a cough knocking on the wall. Then he wouldn't believe next day we didn't do something. It's all very well a husband, but you can't fool a lover. After me telling him we never did anything, of course he didn't believe me. No, it's better he's going where he is. Besides, something always happens with him. The time going to the Mallow concert at Maryborough, ordering boiling soup for the two of us. Then the bell rang. Out he walks down the platform with the soup splashing about, taking spoonfuls of it. Hadn't he the nerve? And the waiter after him, making a holy show of us, screeching in confusion for the engine to start. But he wouldn't pay till he finished it. The two gentlemen in the third-class carriage said he was quite right. So he was, too. He's so pig-headed sometimes when he gets a thing into his head. A good job he was able to open the carriage door with his knife or they'd have taken us on to Cork. I suppose that was done out of revenge on him. Oh, I love jaunting in a train or a car with lovely soft cushions. I wonder, will he take a first class for me? He might want to do it in the train by tipping the guard well. Oh, I suppose there'll be the usual idiots of men gaping at us with their eyes as stupid as ever they can possibly be. That was an exceptional man, that common workman that left us alone in the carriage that day going to Howth. I'd like to find out something about him. One or two tunnels, perhaps. Then you have to look out of the window. All the nicer than coming back. Suppose I never came back. What would they say? Eloped with him. That gets you on on the stage. The last concert I sang at... Where? It's over a year ago. When was it? St. Teresa's Hall, Clarendon Street. Little chits of missies they have now singing. Kathleen Carney and her like, on account of father being in the army and my singing the absent-minded beggar and wearing a brooch for Lord Roberts when I had the map of it all and Poldy not Irish enough. Was it him managed it this time? I wouldn't put it past him. Like he got me on to sing in this Starbuck Mater by going around saying he was putting lead kindly light to music. I put him up to that, till the Jesuits found out he was a Freemason. Thumping the piano, lead thou me on, copied from some old opera. Yes, and he was going about with some of them Shinner Fane lately, or whatever they call themselves, talking his usual trash and nonsense. He says that little man he showed me without the neck is very intelligent, the coming man, Griffith. Is he well? He doesn't look it. That's all I can say. Still, it must have been him. He knew there was a boycott. I hate the mention of politics after the war. That Pretoria and Lady Smith and Bloemfontein, where Gardner, Lieutenant Stanley G., 8th Battalion, 2nd East Lancers Regiment of Enteric Fever. He was a lovely fellow and cocky, and just the right height over me. I'm sure he was brave, too. He said I was lovely the evening we kissed goodbye at the canal lock. My Irish beauty. He was pale with excitement about going away or we'd be seen from the road. He couldn't stand properly, and I so hot as I never felt. They could have made their peace in the beginning. Or old Oom Paul and the rest of the old Krugers go and fight it out between them instead of dragging on for years, killing any fine-looking men there were with their fever. If he was even decently shot, it wouldn't have been so bad. I love to see a regiment pass in review. The first time I saw the Spanish cavalry at La Roque, it was lovely. After looking across the bay from Algeciras, all the lights of the rock like fireflies. Or those sham battles on the fifteen acres, the Black Watch with their kilts and time at the march past, the Tenth Hussars, the Prince of Wales' own, or the Lancers, oh, the Lancers, their grand, or the Dublins that won to Gala. His father made his money over selling the horses for the cavalry. Well, he could buy me a nice present up in Belfast after what I gave. They've lovely linen up there, or one of those nice kimono things. I must buy a mothball like I had before to keep in the drawer with him. It would be exciting going around with him, shopping, buying those things in a new city. Better leave this ring behind. Want to keep turning and turning to get it over the knuckle there. Or they might bell it round the town in their papers or tell the police on me. But they'd think we're married. 
Oh, let them all go and smother themselves for the fat lot I care. He has plenty of money and he's not a marrying man, so somebody better get it out of him. If I can find out whether he likes me. I looked a bit washy, of course, when I looked close on the hand glass, powdering. A mirror never gives you the expression. Besides scrooching down on me like that all the time with his big hip bones, he's heavy too with his hairy chest for this heat, always having to lie down for them. Better for him put it in me from behind, the way Mrs. Mastiansky told me her husband made her, like the dogs do it, and stick out her tongue as far as ever she could. And he's so quiet and mild with his ting-a-ting -ting either. Can you ever be up to men the way it takes them? Lovely stuff in that blue suit he had on, and stylish tie, and socks with the sky-blue silk things on them. He's certainly well off, I know, by the cut his clothes have, and his heavy watch. But he was like a perfect devil for a few minutes after he came back with a stop press, tearing up the tickets and swearing blazes because he lost. Twenty quid, he said he lost, over that outsider that won, and half he put on for me, on account of Lenahan's tip, cursing him to the lowest pits. That sponger. He was making free with me after the Glen Cree dinner coming back, that long jolt over the featherbed mountain, after the Lord Mayor looking at me with his dirty eyes. Val Dillon, that big heathen. I first noticed him at dessert when I was cracking the nuts with my teeth. I wished I could have picked every morsel of that chicken out of my fingers. It was so tasty and browned and as tender as anything, only for I didn't want to eat everything on my plate. Those forks and fish slicers were hallmarked silver, too. I wish I had some. I could easily have slipped a couple into my muff when I was playing with them. Then always hanging out of them for money in a restaurant for the bit you put down your throat. We have to be thankful for our mangy cup of tea itself as a great compliment to be noticed the way the world is divided. In any case, if it's going to go on, I want at least two other good chemises for one thing, and, but I don't know what kind of drawers he likes. None at all, I think. Didn't he say? Yes. And half the girls in Gibraltar never wore them either, naked as God made them. That Andalusian singing her Manola, she didn't make much secret of what she hadn't. Yes, and the second pair of silkette stockings is laddered after one day's wear. I could have brought them back to Lures this morning and kick up a row and made, made that one change them, only not to upset myself and run the risk of walking into him and ruining the whole thing. And one of those kid-fitting corsets I'd want, Advertised cheap in the gentlewoman with elastic gores on the hips. He saved the one I have, but that's no good. What did they say? They give a delightful figure line, eleven and six, obviating that unsightly broad appearance across the lower back to reduce flesh. My belly is a bit too big. I'll have to knock off the stout at dinner. Or am I getting too fond of it? The last they sent from O'Rourke's was as flat as a pancake. He makes his money easy. Larry, they call him. The old mangy parcel he sent at Christmas. A cottage cake and a bottle of hogwash he tried to palm off as claret that he couldn't get anyone to drink. God spare his spit for fear he'd die of the drought. Or I must do a few breathing exercises. I wonder, is that anti-fat any good? Might overdo it. Thin ones are not so much the fashion now. Garters, that much I have. The violet pair I wore today. That's all he bought me out of the check he got on the first. Oh, no, there was the face lotion I finished the last of yesterday that made my skin like new. I told him over and over again, get that made up in the same place and don't forget it. God only knows whether he did after all I said to him. I'll know by the bottle anyway. If not, I suppose I'll only have to wash in my piss like beef tea or chicken soup with some of that apoponax and violet. I thought it was beginning to look coarse or old a bit. The skin underneath is much finer, where it peeled off there on my finger after the burn. It's a pity it isn't all like that. And the four paltry handkerchiefs, about six shillings in all. Sure, you can't get on in this world without style, all going in food and rent. When I get it, I'll lash it around, I tell you, in fine style. I always want to throw a handful of tea into the pot measuring and mincing. If I buy a pair of old brogues itself, do you like those new shoes? Yes, how much were they? I've no clothes at all. 
the brown costume and the skirt and jacket and the one at the cleaners, three. What's that for any woman? Cutting up this old hat and patching up the other. The men won't look at you. And women try to walk on you because they know you've no man. Then, with all the things getting dearer every day, for the four years more I have of life up to 35, I... No, I'm... What am I at all? I'll be 33 in September. Will I what? Oh, well, look at that Mrs. Galbraith. She's much older than me. I saw her when I was out last week. Her beauty's on the wane. She was a lovely woman, magnificent head of hair on her down to her waist, tossing it back like that, like Kitty O'Shea in Grantham Street. First thing I did every morning to look across, see her combing it as if she loved it and was full of it. Pity I only got to know her the day before we left. And that Mrs. Langtree, the Jersey Lily the Prince of Wales was in love with. I suppose he's like the first man going the roads only for the name of a king. They're all made the one way. Only a black man's I'd like to try. A beauty up to... What was she? Forty-five. There was some funny story about the jealous old husband. What was it all? And an oyster knife. He went... No. He made her wear a kind of a tin thing around her. And the Prince of Wales... Yes, he had the oyster knife. Can't be true a thing like that. Like some of those books he brings me. The works of Master Francois, somebody supposed to be a priest, about a child born out of her ear because her bum gut fell out. A nice word for any priest to write. And her A blank E, as if any fool wouldn't know what that meant. I hate that pretending of all things. With the old blackguard's face on him, anybody can see it's not true. And that ruby and fair tyrants, he brought me that twice. I remember when I came to page 50, the part about where she hangs him up out of a hoof with a cord flagellate. Sure, there's nothing for a woman in that. All invention made up about he drinking the champagne out of her slipper after the ball was over. Like the infant Jesus in the crib at Inchicore in the Blessed Virgin's arms, sure no woman could have a child that big taken out of her. And I thought first it came out of her side, because how could she go to the chamber when she wanted to? And she, a rich lady, of course, she felt honored. H.R.H., he was in Gibraltar the year I was born. I bet he found lilies there, too, where he planted the tree. He planted more than that in his time. He might have planted me, too, if he'd come a bit sooner. Then I wouldn't be here as I am. He ought to chuck that Freeman with the paltry few shillings he knocks out of it and go into an office or something where he'd get regular pay or a, or a bank where they could put him up on a throne to count the money all the day. Of course, he prefers plottering about the house so you can't stir with him any side. What's your program today? I wish he'd even smoke a pipe like father to get the smell of a man. Or pretending to be mooching about for advertisements when he could have been in Mr. Cuff's still only for what he did then sending me to try and patch it up. I could have got him promoted there to be the manager. He gave me a great mirada once or twice. First he was as stiff as the mischief, really and truly, Mrs. Bloom. Only I felt rotten simply with the old rubbishy dress that I lost the leads out of the tails with no cut in it. But they're coming into fashion again. I bought it simply to please him. I knew it was no good by the finish. Pity I'd changed my mind of going to Todd and Burns, as I said, and not Lee's. It was just like the shop itself, rummage sale, a lot of trash. I hate those rich shops. Get on your nerves. Nothing kills me altogether, only he thinks he knows a great deal about a woman's dress and cooking, mathering everything he can scour off the shelves into it. If I went by his advices, every blessed hat I put on, does that suit me? Yes, take that, that's all right. The one like a wedding cake standing up miles off my head, he said, suited me. Or the dish cover one coming down on my backside. On pins and needles about the shop girl in that place in Grafton Street, I had the misfortune to bring him into. And she as insolent as ever she could be with her smirk. Saying, I'm afraid we're giving you too much trouble. What's she there for? But I stared it out of her. Yes, he was awfully stiff. And no wonder... But he changed the second time he looked. Poldy, pig-headed as usual, like the soup. But I could see him looking very hard at my chest when he stood up to open the door for me. It was nice of him to show me out in any case. I'm extremely sorry, Mrs. Bloom, believe me. 
without making it too marked the first time, after him being insulted and me being supposed to be his wife, I just half smiled. I know my chest was out that way at the door when he said, I'm extremely sorry. And I'm sure you were. Yes, I think he made them a bit firmer, sucking them like that so long. He made me thirsty. Titties, he calls them. I had to laugh. Yes, this one anyhow. Stiff the nipple gets for the least thing. I'll get him to keep that up, and I'll take those eggs beaten up with marsala, fatten them out for him. What are all those veins and things? Curious the way it's made. Two the same in case of twins. They're supposed to represent beauty placed up there, like those statues in the museum. One of them pretending to hide it with her hand. Why are they so beautiful? Of course, compared with what a man looks like, with his two bags full and his other thing hanging down out of him or sticking up at you like a hat rack. No wonder they hide it with a cabbage leaf. The woman is beauty, of course, that's admitted. When he said I could pose for a picture naked to some rich fellow in Hollis Street when he lost the job in Healy's and I was selling the clothes and strumming in the coffee palace, would I be like that bath of the nymph with my hair down? Yes, only she's younger. Or I'm a little like that dirty bitch in that Spanish photo he has. The nymphs used to go about like that. I asked him. That disgusting Cameron Highlander behind the meat market. Or that other wretch with the red head behind the tree where the statue of the fish used to be when I was passing, pretending he was pissing, standing out for me to see it with his baby clothes up to one side. The Queen's own, they were a nice lot. It's well the Surreys relieved them. They're always trying to show it to you. Every time nearly I passed outside the men's greenhouse near the Harcourt Street station, just to try, some fellow other trying to catch my eye or if it was one of the seven wonders of the world. Oh, and the stink of those rotten places. The night coming home with Poldy after the Comerford's party. Oranges and lemonade to make it feel nice and watery. I went into one of them. It was so biting cold I couldn't keep it. When was that? Ninety-three, the canal was frozen. Yes, it was a few months after. A pity a couple of the Camerons weren't there to see me squatting in the men's place, Meathero. I tried to draw a picture of it before I tore it up. Like a sausage or something. I wonder they're not afraid going about or getting a kick or a bang or something there. And that word met something with hoses in it. And he came out with some jawbreakers about the incarnation. He never can explain a thing simply the way a body can understand. Then he goes and burns the bottom out of the pan, all for his kidney. This one, not so much. There's the mark of his teeth still where he tried to bite the nipple. I had to scream out. Aren't they fearful trying to hurt you? I had a great breast of milk with Millie, enough for two. What was the reason of that? He said I could have got a pound a week as a wet nurse. All swelled out. The morning that delicate-looking student that stopped in number 28 with the citrons, Penrose, nearly caught me washing through the window, only for I snapped up the towel to my face. That was his studenting. Hurt me, they used to, weaning her, till he got Dr. Brady to give me the Belladonna prescription. I had to get him to suck them, they were so hard. He said it was sweeter and thicker than cows. Then he wanted to milk me into the tea. Well, he's beyond everything. I declare somebody ought to put him in the budget. If I only could remember the one half of the things and write a book out of it, the works of Master Poldy. Yes, and it's so much smoother, the skin. Much. An hour he was at them, I'm sure, by the clock. Like some kind of a big infant I had at me. They want everything in their mouth. All the pleasure those men get out of a woman. I can feel his mouth. Oh, Lord, I must stretch myself. I wished he was here or somebody to let myself go with and come again like that. I feel all fire inside me. Or if I could dream it. When he made me spend the second time tickling me behind with his finger, I, I was coming for about five minutes with my legs round him. I had to hug him after. Oh, Lord, I wanted to... I wanted to shout out all sorts of things, fuck or shit or anything at all, only not to look ugly or those lines from the strain. Who knows the way he'd take it? You want to feel your way with a man. They're not all like him, thank God. Some of them want you to be so nice about it. I noticed the contrast. He does it and doesn't talk. I gave my eyes that look 
with my hair a bit loose from the tumbling and my tongue between my lips up to him, the savage brute. Thursday, Friday, one, Saturday, two, Sunday, three. Oh, Lord, I can't wait till Monday. See from train somewhere whistling. The strength those engines have in them, like big giants in the water rolling all over and out of them all sides. Like the end of love's old sweet song. The poor men that have to be out all the night from their wives and families in those roasting engines. Stifling it was today. I'm glad I burned the half of those old Freemans and photo bits, leaving things like that lying around. He's getting very careless. And threw the rest of them up in the W.C. I'll get him to cut them tomorrow for me, instead of having them there for the next year to get a few pence for them. Have him asking, where's last January's paper? And all those old overcoats I bundled out of the hall, making the place hotter than it is. The rain was lovely just after my beauty sleep. I thought it was going to get like Gibraltar. My goodness, the heat there before the Levanter came on, black as night, and the glare of the rock standing up in it like a big giant compared with their three-rock mountain they think is so great, with the red sentries here and there, the poplars, and they all white-hot, and the mosquito nets and the smell of the rainwater in those tanks. Watching the sun all the time weltering down on you faded all that lovely frock father's friend Mrs. Stanhope sent me from the B. Marche, Paris. What a shame. My dearest Dogarina, she wrote. On what? She was very nice. What's this her other name was? Just a PC to tell you I sent the little present. Have just had a jolly warm bath and feel a very clean dog now. Enjoyed it. Wagger, she called him. Wagger would give anything to be back in jib and hear you sing in old Madrid or waiting. Concon is the name of those exercises. He brought me one of those new, some word I couldn't make out, shawls, amusing things, but tear for the least thing. Still, they're lovely, I think, don't you? We'll always think of the lovely teas we had together, scrumptious currant scones and raspberry wafers I adore. Well, now, dearest Dogarina, be sure and write soon. Kind, she left out. Regards to your father, also Captain Grove, with love, yours affectionately, XXXXX. She didn't look a bit married, just like a girl. He was years older than her, Wagger. He was awfully fond of me. When he held down the wire with his foot for me to step over at the bullfight at La Linea, when that matador Gomez was given the bull's ear. Clothes we have to wear, whoever invented them, expecting you to walk up Killini Hill. Then, for example, at that picnic, all stazed up. You can't do a blessed thing in them in a crowd, run or jump out of the way. That's why I was afraid when that other ferocious old bull began to charge the banderillos with the sashes and the two things in their hats, and the brutes of men shouting, Bravo Toro! Sure, the women were as bad in their nice white mantillas, ripping all the whole insides out of those poor horses. I never heard of such a thing in all my life. Yes, he used to break his heart at me taking off the dog, barking in Bell Lane, poor brute, and it's sick. What became of them ever? I suppose they're dead long ago, the two of them. It's like all through a mist. Makes you feel so old. I made the scones, of course. I had everything all to myself. Then a girl, Hester. We used to compare our hair. Mine was thicker than hers. She showed me how to settle it at the back when I put it up. And what's this else? How to make a knot on a thread with the one hand. We were like cousins. What age was I then? The night of the storm, I slept in her bed. She had her arms round me. Then we were fighting in the morning with the pillow. What fun. He was watching me whenever he had got an opportunity at the band on the Alameda Esplanade when I was with Father and Captain Grove. I looked up at the church first and then at the windows, then down, and our eyes met. I felt something go through me like all needles, my eyes were dancing, I remember, after, when I looked at myself in the glass. Hardly recognized myself, the change. I had a splendid skin from the sun and the excitement, like a rose. I didn't get a wink of sleep. It wouldn't have been nice on account of her, but I could have stopped it in time. 
She gave me the Moonstone to read. That was the first I read of Wilkie Collins. East Lynn I read, and The Shadow of Ashley Deitt, Mrs. Henry Wood, Henry Dunbar by that other woman. I lent him afterwards with Mulvey's photo in it, so as he see I wasn't without. And Lord Lytton, Eugene Aram, Molly Bourne she gave me by Mrs. Hungerford on account of the name. I don't like books with a Molly in them, like that one he brought me about the one from Flanders, a whore, always shoplifting, anything she could, cloth and stuff and yards of it. This blanket is too heavy on me. That's better. I haven't even one decent night dress. This thing gets all rolled up under me besides him and his fooling. That's better. I used to be weltering then in the heat, my shift drenched with the sweat, stuck in the cheeks of my bottom on the chair when I stood up. They were so fattish and firm when I got up on the sofa cushions to see with my clothes up and the bugs, tons of them at night, and the mosquito nets. I couldn't read a line. Lord, how long ago it seems, centuries. Of course, they never came back. And she didn't put her address right on it, either. She may have noticed her wagger. People were always going away, and we never. I remember that day, with the waves and the boats with their high heads rocking, and the swell of the ship, those officers' uniforms on shore leave, made me seasick. He didn't say anything. He was very serious. I had the high-buttoned boots on, and my skirt was blowing. She kissed me six or seven times. Didn't I cry? Yes, I believe I did, or near it. My lips were tatering when I said goodbye. She had a gorgeous wrap of some special kind of blue color on her for the voyage, made very peculiarly to one side like, and it was extremely pretty. It got as dull as the devil after they went. I was almost planning to run away mad out of it somewhere. We're never easy where we are. Father or aunt or marriage, waiting, always waiting to guide him to me, waiting nor speed his flying feet. The damn guns bursting and booming all over the shop, especially the Queen's birthday, and throwing everything down in all directions if you didn't open the windows. When General Ulysses Grant, whoever he was or did, supposed to be some great fellow, landed off the ship, and old Sprague, the consul that was there from before the flood, dressed up, poor man, and he in mourning for the sun then. The same old revalley in the morning, and drums rolling, and the unfortunate poor devils of soldiers walking about with mess tins, smelling the place more than the old long-bearded Jews and their jellybees and Levites' assembly and sound clear and gunfire for the men to cross the lines, and the warden marching with his keys to lock the gates, and the bagpipes, and only Captain Groves and Father talking about Rourke's Drift and Plevna and Sir Garnet Woolsey and Gordon at Khartoum, lighting their pipes for them every time they went out. Drunken old devil with his grog on the windowsill, catch him leaving any of it picking his nose, trying to think of some other dirty story to tell up in a corner, but he never forgot himself when I was there, sending me out of the room on some blind excuse, paying his compliments, the Bushmills whiskey talking, of course, but he'd do the same to the next woman that came along. I suppose he died of galloping drink ages ago. The days like years, not a letter from a living soul except the odd few I posted to myself with bits of paper in them, so bored sometimes I could fight with my nails, listening to that old Arab with the one eye and his he-ass of an instrument, singing his here, 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 all my compliments on your hotcha potch of your he-ass. As bad as now, the hands hanging off me, looking out of the window. If there was a nice fella even in the opposite house, that medical in Hollis Street the nurse was after, when I put on my gloves and hat at the window to show I was going out, not a notion what I meant. Aren't they thick? Never understand what you say. Even you'd want to print it up on a big poster for them. Not even if you shake hands twice with the left. He didn't recognize me either when I half frowned at him outside Westland Row Chapel. Where does their great intelligence come in, I'd like to know? Gray matter. They have it all in their tail, if you ask me. Those country gougers up in the city arms intelligence. 
They had a damn sight less than the bulls and cows they were selling. The meat in the callman's bell, that noisy bugger trying to swindle me with the wrong bill he took out of his hat. What a pair of paws, and pots and pans and kettles to mend. Any broken bottles for a poor man today? And no visitors or post ever except his checks or some advertisement. Like that wonder worker they sent him addressed, Dear Madam. Only his letter and the card from Millie this morning. See, she wrote a letter to him. Who did I get the last letter from? Oh, Mrs. Dwen. Now, whatever possessed her to write after so many years to know the recipe I had for Pisto Madrileño? Floey Dillon, since. She wrote to say she was married to a very rich architect, if I'm to believe all I hear, with a villa and eight rooms. Her father was an awfully nice man. He was near seventy, always good humor. Well, now, Miss Tweedy or Miss Gillespie, there's the piano. That was a solid silver coffee service he had, too, on the mahogany sideboard. Then dying so far away. I hate people that have always their poor story to tell. Everybody has their own troubles. That poor Nancy Blake died a month ago of acute pneumonia. Well, I didn't know her so well as all that. She was Floyd's friend more than mine. It's a bother having to answer her. He always tells me the wrong things and no stops to, to say, like, like making a speech, your sad bereavement, sympathy. I always make that mistake. And new few with two W's in it. I hope he'll write me a longer letter the next time, if it's a thing he really likes me. Oh, thanks be to the great God, I got somebody to give me what I badly wanted to put some heart up into me. You've no chances at all in this place like you used long ago. I wish somebody would write me a love letter. His wasn't much. I told him he could write what he liked. Yours ever, Hugh Boylan. In old Madrid, silly women believe love is sighing, I am dying. Still, if he wrote it, I suppose there'd be some truth in it. True or no, it fills up your whole day and life. Always something to think about every moment and see it all around you like a new world. I could write the answer in bed to let him imagine me. Short, just a few words. Not those long, crossed letters Attie Dillon used to write to the fellow that was something in the four courts that jilted her after, out of the lady's letter writer. When I told her to say a few simple words, he could twist how he liked, not acting with precip precipitancy, with equal candor, the greatest earthly happiness. Answer to a gentleman's proposal affirmatively. My goodness, there's nothing else. It's all very fine for them, but as for being a woman, as soon as you're old, they might as well throw you out in the bottom of the ash pit. Mulvey's was the first, when I was in bed that morning, and Mrs. Rubio brought it in with the coffee. She stood there standing when I asked her to hand me, and I pointing at them, I couldn't think of the word, a hairpin to open it with. Ah, Orquilla, disobliging old thing, and it staring her in the face with her switch of false hair on her, and vain about her appearance, ugly as she was, near eighty or a hundred, her face a mass of wrinkles, with all her religion domineering, because she could never get over the Atlantic fleet coming in, half the ships of the world, and the Union Jack flying, with all her carabineros, because four drunken English sailors took all the rock from them, and because I didn't run into mass often enough in Santa Maria to please her, with her shawl up on her, except when there was a marriage on, with all her miracles of the saints and her black blessed virgin with the silver dress and the sun dancing, three times on Easter Sunday morning, and when the priest was going by with the bell bringing the Vatican to the dying, blessing herself for his majestad, an admirer, he signed it. I near jumped out of my skin. I wanted to pick him up when I saw him following me along the Calle Real in the shop window. Then he tipped me just in passing. I never thought he'd write making an appointment. I had it inside my petticoat bodice all day, reading it up in every hole and corner, while father was up at the drill instructing, to find out by the handwriting or the language of stamps. Singing, I remember, shall I wear a white rose? And I wanted to put on the old stupid clock to near the time. He was the first man kissed me, under the Moorish wall, my sweetheart, when a boy. It never entered my head what kissing meant till he put his tongue in my mouth. 
His mouth was sweet like young. I put my knee up to him a few times to learn the way. What did I tell him? I was engaged, for fun, to the son of a Spanish nobleman named Don Miguel de la Flora, and he believed that I was to be married to him in three years' time. There's many a true word spoken in jest. There is a flower that bloometh. A few things I told him true about myself, just for him to be imagining. The Spanish girls he didn't like. I suppose one of them wouldn't have him. I got him excited. He crushed all the flowers on my bosom he brought me. He couldn't count the pesetas and the peragordas till I taught him. Capoquin he came from, he said, on the black water. But it was too short then. The day before he left. May, yes, it was May, when the infant king of Spain was born. I'm always like that in the spring. I'd like a new fellow every year. Up on the tip-top under the rock gun near O'Hara's tower, I told him it was struck by lightning and all about the old Barbary apes they sent to Clapham without a tail careering all over the show on each other's back. Mrs. Rubio said she was a regular old rock scorpion robbing the chickens out of the Inces farm and throw stones at you if you went anear. He was looking at me. I had that white blouse on, open at the front to encourage him as much as I could without too openly. They were just beginning to be plump. I said I was tired. We lay over the fir tree cove, a wild place. I suppose it must be the highest rock in existence. The galleries and casemates and those frightful rocks and St. Michael's Cave with the icicles or whatever they call them hanging down and ladders, all the mud plotching my boots. I'm sure that's the way down the monkeys go under the sea to Africa when they die. The ships out far like chips. That was the Malta boat passing. Yes, the sea and the sky. You could do what you liked, lie there forever. He caressed them outside. They love doing that. It's the roundness. There I was leaning over him with my white rice straw hat to take the newness out of it, the left side of my face the best my blouse open for his last day. Transparent kind of shirt he had. I could see his chest pink. He wanted to touch mine with his for a moment, but I wouldn't let him. He was awfully put out. First for fear, you never know, consumption or leave me with a child, embarazada. That old servant, Inez, told me that one drop even, if it got into you at all, We hope you are enjoying this classic book reading by Alexander Scorby. Please subscribe, like, and share the link with others. Click the playlist link in the description box below for more classic book readings. After I tried with the banana, but I was afraid it might break and get lost up in me somewhere, Yes, because they once took something down out of a woman that was up there for years, covered with lime salts. They're all mad to get in there where they come out of. You'd think they could never get far enough up. And then they're done with you, in a way, till the next time. Yes, because there's a wonderful feeling there all the time, so tender. How did we finish it off? Yes, oh yes, I pulled him off into my handkerchief, pretending not to be excited. But I opened my legs. I wouldn't let him touch me inside my petticoat. I had a skirt opening up the side. I tortured the life out of him first, tickling him. I loved rousing that dog in the hotel. Rusta wuk wuk wuk. His eyes shut and a bird flying below us. He was shy all the same. I liked him like that morning. I made him blush a little when I got over him that way, when I unbuttoned him and took his out and drew back the skin. It had a kind of eye in it. They're all buttons, men, down the middle on the wrong side of them. Molly Darling, he called me. What was his name? Jack? Joe? Harry Mulvey, was it? Yes. I think a lieutenant. He was rather fair. He had a laughing kind of a voice. So I went around to the what-you-call-it. Everything was what-you-call-it. Mustache, had he? He said he'd come back. Lord, it's just like yesterday, 
to me, and if I was married, he'd do it to me, and I promised him yes faithfully. I'd let him block me now flying. Perhaps he's dead or killed or a captain or admiral. It's nearly 20 years. If I said Fir Tree Cove, he would, if he came up behind me and put his hands over my eyes to guess who. I might recognize him. He's young still, about 40 perhaps. He's married some girl on the black water and is quite changed. They all do. They haven't half the character a woman has. She little knows what I did with her beloved husband before he ever dreamt of her. In broad daylight, too, in the sight of the whole world, you might say. They could have put an article about it in the Chronicle. I was a bit wild after, when I blew out the old bag the biscuits were in from Benadi Brothers and exploded it. Lord, what a bang, all the woodcocks and pigeons screaming. Coming back the same way that we went, over Middle Hill, round by the old guardhouse and the Jews' burial place, pretending to read out the Hebrew on them. I wanted to fire his pistol. He said he hadn't one. He didn't know what to make of me, with his peaked cap on that he always wore crooked as often as I settled it straight, HMS Calypso, swinging my hat. That old bishop that spoke off the altar, his long preach about woman's higher functions, about girls now riding the bicycle and wearing peak caps and the new woman bloomers. God send him sense and me more money. I suppose they're called after him. I never thought that would be my name, Bloom, when I used to write it in print to see how it looked on a visiting card or practicing for the butcher, and oblige M. Bloom. You're looking blooming, Josie used to say after I married him. Well, it's better than Breen or Briggs. Does Brig or those awful names with bottom in them, Mrs. Ramsbottom or some other kind of a bottom, Mulvey I wouldn't go mad about either. Or suppose I divorced him. Mrs. Boylan. My mother, whoever she was, might have given me a nicer name, the Lord knows, after the lovely one she had, Lunita Laredo. The fun we had running along Willis Road to Europa Point, twisting in and out all around the other side of Jersey, they were shaking and dancing about in my blouse, like Millie's little ones now when she runs up the stairs. I loved looking down at them. I was jumping up at the pepper trees and the white poplars, pulling the leaves off and throwing them at him. He went to India. He was to write the voyages those men have to make to the ends of the world and back. It's the least they might get a squeeze or two at a woman while they can, going out to be drowned or blown up somewhere. I went up Windmill Hill to the flats that Sunday morning. Would Captain Rubios that was? dead. Spyglass like the sentry had. He said he'd have one or two from on board. I wore that frock from the B. Marche, Paris, and the coral necklace. The straits shining, I could see over to Morocco almost. The Bay of Tangier, white, and the Atlas Mountain with snow on it, and the straits like a river, so clear. Harry, Molly, darling. I was thinking of him on the sea all the time after at Mass, when my petticoat began to slip down at the elevation. Weeks and weeks I kept the handkerchief under my pillow for the smell of him. There was no decent perfume to be got in that Gibraltar, only that cheap peau d'Espagne that faded and left a stink on you. More than anything else, I wanted to give him a memento. He gave me that clumsy cladar ring for luck that I gave Gardner going to South Africa where those boars killed him with their war and fever, but they were well beaten all the same as if it brought its bad luck with it, like an opal or pearl. Must have been pure sixteen-carat gold, because it was very heavy. I can see his face, clean-shaven. Frissi, from A train again. Weeping tone. Once in the dear dead days beyond recall. Close my eyes, breath, my lips forward, kiss, sad look, eyes open, piano. Ere o'er the world the mists began, I hate that ist speak, comes love's sweet song. I let that out full. When I get in front of the footlights again, <laughs> Kathleen Carney and her lot of squealers, miss this, miss that, miss the other, a lot of sparrow farts, skitting around talking about politics they know as much about as my backside. Anything in the world to make themselves some way interesting. Irish homemade beauties. 
Soldier's daughter am I. I and whose are you? Bootmakers and publicans. I beg your pardon, coach. I thought you were a wheelbarrow. They'd die down dead off their feet if ever they got a chance of walking down the Alameda on an officer's arm like me on the band night. My eyes flash. My bust, that they haven't. Passion. God help their poor head. I knew more about men in life when I was fifteen than they'll all know at fifty. They don't know how to sing a song like that. Gardner said no man could look at my mouth and teeth smiling like that and not think of it. I was afraid he mightn't like my accent first. He so English. All father left me in spite of his stamps. I have my mother's eyes and figure anyhow, he always said. They're so snotty about themselves, some of those cads. He wasn't a bit like that. He was dead gone on my lips. Let them get a husband first that's fit to be looked at, and a daughter like mine, or see if they can excite a swell with money they can pick and choose whoever he wants like Boylan to do it four or five times locked in each other's arms. Or the voice, either. I could have been a prima donna, only I married him. Comes love's old, deep down, chin back, not too much, make a double. My lady's bower is too long for an encore. About the moated grange at twilight and vaulted rooms. Yes, I'll sing Winds That Blow From The South that he gave after the choir stairs performance. I'll change that lace on my black dress to show off my bubs, and I'll... Yes, by God, I'll get that big fan mended, make them burst with envy. My hole is itching me. Always when I think of him, I feel I want to... I feel some wind in me. Better go easy, not wake him. Have him at it again, slobbering, after washing every bit of myself, back, belly, and sides. If we had even a bath itself, or my own room, anyway. I wish he'd sleep in some bed by himself with his cold feet on me. Give us room even to let a fart, God, or do the least thing. Better, yes, hold him like that. A bit on my side. Piano. Quietly, sweet, there's that train far away, pianissimo. E one more song. That was a relief. Wherever you be, let your wind go free. Who knows if that pork chop I took with my cup of tea after was quite good with the heat. I couldn't smell anything of it. I'm sure that queer-looking man in the pork butchers is a great rogue. I hope that lamp is not smoking. Fill my nose up with smuts. Better than having him leaving the gas on all night. I couldn't rest easy in my bed. In Gibraltar, even. Getting up to sea. Why am I so damn nervous about that? Though I like it in the winter, it's more company. Oh, Lord, it was rotten cold, too, that winter, when I was only about ten, was I? Yes. I had the big doll with all the funny clothes, dressing her up and undressing. That icy wind skeeting across from those mountains, the something Nevada, Sierra Nevada, standing at the fire with a little bit of a short shift I had up to heat myself. I love dancing about in it, then make a race back into bed. I'm sure that fellow opposite used to be there the whole time watching with the lights out in the summer, and I and my skin hopping around. I used to love myself, then stripped at the washstand, dabbing and creaming, only when it came to the chamber performance, I put out the light, too. So then there were two of us. Goodbye to my sleep for this night, anyhow. I hope he's not going to get in with those medicals, leading him astray to imagine he's young again, coming in at four in the morning, it must be, if not more. Still, he had the manners not to wake me. What do they find to gabber about all night, squandering money and getting drunker and drunker? Couldn't they drink water? Then he starts giving us his orders for eggs and tea, Finn and Haddie, and hot buttered toast. I suppose we'll have him sitting up like the king of the country, pumping the wrong end of the spoon up and down in his egg, wherever he learned that from. And I love to hear him falling up the stairs of a morning with the cups rattling on the tray, and then play with the cat. She rubs up against you for her own sake. I wonder, has she fleas? She's as bad as a woman, always licking and lecking. But I hate their claws. I, I wonder, do they see anything that we can't? Staring like that when she sits at the top of the stairs so long and listening as I wait. Always. What a robber, too. That lovely fresh place I bought. 
I think I'll get a bit of fish tomorrow or today. Is it Friday? Yes, I will, with some blancmange with black currant jam like long ago. Not those two-pound pots of mixed plum and apple from the London and Newcastle. Williams and Woods goes twice as far. Only for the bones. I hate those eels. Cod. Yes, I'll get a nice piece of cod. I'm always getting enough for three, forgetting. Anyway, I'm sick of that everlasting butcher's meat from Buckley's. Loin chops and leg beef and rib steak and scrag of mutton and calf's pluck. The very name is enough. For... Or a picnic. Suppose we all gave five shillings each and... Or let him pay and invite some other woman for him. Who? Mrs. Fleming? And drive out to the furry glen or the strawberry beds. Oh, we'd have him examining all the horse's toenails first, like he does with the letters. No, no not with Boylan there. Yes, with some cold veal and ham mixed sandwiches. There are little houses down at the bottom of the banks there on purpose, but it's as hot as blazes, he says. Not a bank holiday, anyhow. I hate those ruck of Mary Ann cold boxes out for the day. Whit Monday is a cursed day, too. No wonder that bee bit him. Better the seaside. But I'd never again in this life get into a boat with him after him at Bray telling the boatman he knew how to row. If anyone asked, could he ride the steeplechase for the gold cup, he'd say yes. When it came on to get rough, the old thing crookeding about and the weight all down my side, telling me to... Pull the right reins, now pull the left, and the tide all swamping and floods in through, through the bottom, and his oar slipping out of the stirrup. It's a mercy we weren't all drowned. He can swim, of course, me, no. There's no danger whatsoever. Keep yourself calm in his flannel trousers. I'd like to have tattered them down off him before all the people and given what that one calls flagellate till he was black and blue, do him all the good in the world. Only for that long-nosed chap, I, I don't know who he is, with that other beauty, Burke, out of the City Arms Hotel, was there spying around as usual on the slip, always where he wasn't wanted if there was a row on. You vomit a better face. There was no love lost between us. That's one consolation. I wonder what kind is that book he brought me, Sweets of Sin, by a gentleman of fashion. Some other Mr. de Kock, I suppose. The people gave him that nickname, going about with his tube from one woman to another. I couldn't even change my new white shoes, all ruined with the salt water, and the hat I had with that feather all blowy and tossed on me. How annoying and provoking, because the smell of the sea excited me, of course. The sardines and the bream in Catalan Bay round the back of the rock. They were fine, all silver in the fishermen's baskets. Old Luigi, near a hundred, they said, came from Genoa, and the tall old chap with the earrings. I don't like a man you have to climb up to go get at. I suppose they're all dead and rotten long ago. Besides, I don't like being alone in this big barracks of a place at night. I suppose I'll have to put up with it. I never brought a bit of salt in, even, when we moved in the confusion. Musical Academy was going to make on the first floor. Drawing room with a brass plate. Or Bloom's private hotel, he suggested. Go and ruin himself altogether the way his father did down in Ennis like all the things he told Father he was going to do, and me. But I saw through him, telling me all the lovely places we would go for the honeymoon, Venice by moonlight with the gondolas, and the Lake of Como he had a picture cut out of some paper of, and mandolins and lanterns. Oh, how nice, I said. Whatever I liked he was going to do immediately, if not sooner. Will you be my man? Will you carry my can? <laughs> you ought to get a leather medal with a putty rim for all the plans he invents. Then leaving us here all day. You never know what old beggar at the door for a crust with his long story might be a tramp and put his foot in the way to prevent me shutting it. Like that picture of that hardened criminal he was called in Lloyd's Weekly News. Twenty years in jail. Then he comes out and murders an old woman for her money. Imagine his poor wife or mother or whoever she is. Such a face he had run miles away from. I couldn't rest easy till I bolted all the doors and windows to make sure. But it's worse again being locked up like in a prison or a madhouse. They ought to be all shot, or the cat and nine tails, a big brute like that that would attack a poor old woman to murder her in a bed. I'd cut them off so I would. Not that he'd be much use. Still better than nothing. 
the night I was sure I heard burglars in the kitchen, and he went down in his shirt with a candle and a poker as if he was looking for a mouse, as white as a sheet, frightened out of his wits, making as much noise as he possibly could for the burglar's benefit. There isn't much to steal, indeed, the Lord knows. Still, it's the feeling, especially now with Millie away. Such an idea for him to send the girl down there to learn to take photographs on account of his grandfather, instead of sending her to Scary's Academy where she'd have to learn, not like me, getting all at school. Only he'd do a thing like that all the same. On account of me and Boylan, that's why he did it. I'm certain, the way he plots and plans everything out. I couldn't turn round with her in the place lately, unless I bolted the door first. Gave me the fidgets coming in without knocking first, when I put the chair against the door, just as I was washing myself there below with a glove. Get on your nerves. Then doing the log lady all day, put her in a glass case with two at a time to look at her. If he knew she broke off the hand of off that little Jim Crack statue with her roughness and carelessness before she left, but I got that little Italian boy to mend so that you can't see the join for two shillings, wouldn't even team the potatoes for you. Of course, she's right not to ruin her hands. I noticed he was always talking to her lately at the table, explaining things in the paper, and she pretending to understand. Sly, of course, that comes from his side of the house, and helping her into her coat. But if there was anything wrong with her, it's me, she'd tell, not him. He can't say I pretend things, can he? I'm too honest. As a matter of fact, I suppose he thinks I'm finished out and laid on the shelf. Well, I'm not. No, nor anything like it. We'll see, we'll see. Now she's well on for flirting, too, with Tom Devon's two sons, imitating me, whistling, with those romps of muddy girls calling for her. Can Millie come out, please? She's in great demand to pick what they can out of her round in Nelson Street, riding Harry Devon's bicycle at night. It's as well he sent her where she is. She was just getting out of bounds, wanting to go on the skating rink and smoking their cigarettes through their nose. I smelt it off her dress when I was biting off the thread of the button I sewed onto the bottom of her jacket. She couldn't hide much from me, I tell you. Only I oughtn't to have stitched it and it on her. It brings a parting. And the last plum pudding, too, split in two halves. See, it comes out no matter what they say. Her tongue is a bit too long for my taste. Your blouse is open too low, she says to me. The pan calling the kettle black bottom. And I had to tell her not to cock her legs up like that on show on the windowsill before all the people passing. They all look at her, like me when I was her age. Of course, any old rag looks well on you then. A great touch me not too in her own way. At the only way in the Theatre Royal... Take your foot away out of that. I hate people touching me. Afraid of her life, I'd crush her skirt with the pleats. A lot of that touching must go on in the theatres and the crush in the dark. They're always trying to wiggle up to you. That fell in the pit at the gaiety for Beerbohm Tree in Trilby. Last time I'll ever go there to be squashed like that for any Trilby or her Beerbohm. Every two minutes tipping me there and looking away. He's a bit daft, I think. I saw him after trying to get near two stylish dressed ladies outside Switzer's window at the same little game. I recognized him on the moment, the face and everything, but he didn't remember me. And she didn't even want me to kiss her at the broad stone going away. Well, I hope she'll get someone to dance attendance on her the way I did when she was down with the mumps, her glands swollen. Where's this and where's that? Of course, she can't feel anything deep. Yet I never came properly till I was, what, twenty-two or so. It went into the wrong place always. Only the usual girl's nonsense and giggling, that Connie Connolly writing to her in white ink on black paper sealed with sealing wax. Though she clapped when the curtain came down, because he looked so handsome. Then we had Martin Harvey for breakfast, dinner, and supper. I thought to myself afterwards, it must be real love if a man gives up his life for her that way for nothing. I suppose there are few men like that left. It's, it's hard to believe in it, though, unless it really happened to me. The majority of them with not a particle of love in their natures. To find two people like that nowadays, full up of each other, 
that would feel the same way as you do? They're usually a bit foolish in the head. His father must have been a bit queer to go and poison himself after her. Still, poor old man, I suppose he felt lost. Always making love to my things, too. The few old rags I have, wanting to put her hair up at fifteen. My powder, too, only ruin her skin on her. She's time enough for that, all her life after. Of course, she's restless, knowing she's pretty. With her lips so red, a pity they won't stay that way. I was, too. But there's no use going to the fair with the thing, answering me like a fishwoman when I ask to go for a half a stone of potatoes the day we met Mrs. Joe Gallagher at the trotting matches, and she pretended not to see us in her trap with Freery, the solicitor. We weren't grand enough. Till I gave her two damn fine cracks across the ear for herself. Take that now for answering me like that, and that for your impudence. She had me that exasperated, of course, contradicting. I was bad-tempered, too, because how was it? There was a weed in the tea, or I didn't sleep the night before. Cheese I ate, was it? And I told her over and over again not to leave knives crossed like that, because she has nobody to command her, as she said herself. Well, if he doesn't correct her faith, I will. That was the last time she turned on the tear tap. I was just like that myself. They daren't order me about the place. It's his fault, of course, having the two of us slaving here, instead of getting in a woman long ago. Am I ever going to have a proper servant again? Of course... Then she'd see him coming. I'd have to let her know or she'd revenge it. Aren't they a nuisance? That old Mrs. Fleming. You have to be walking round after her, putting the things into her hands, sneezing and farting into the pots. Well, of course she's old. She can't help it. A good job I found that rotten old smelly dishcloth that got lost behind the dresser. I knew there was something. And opened the window to let out the smell. Bringing in his friends to entertain them. Like the night he walked home with a dog, if you please, that might have been mad. Especially Simon Dedalus's son, his father, such a criticizer, with his glasses up, with his tall hat on him at the cricket match, and a great big hole in his sock. One thing laughing at the other. And his son that got all those prizes for whatever he won them in the intermediate. Imagine climbing over the railings. If anybody saw him that knew us... Wonder he didn't tear a big hole in his grand funeral trousers, as if the one nature gave wasn't enough for anybody. Hawking him down into the dirty old kitchen. Now, is he right in his head, I ask? Pity it wasn't washing day. My old pair of drawers might have been hanging up two on the line on exhibition for all he'd ever care. With the iron mold mark the stupid old bundle burned on them, he might think was something else. And she never even rendered down the fat, I told her. Now she's going, such as she was, on account of her paralyzed husband getting worse. There's always something wrong with them. Disease, or they have to go under an operation, or if it's not that, it's drink, and he beats her. I'll have to hunt around again for someone. Every day I get up, there's some new thing on. Sweet God, sweet God. Well, when I'm stretched out dead in my grave, I suppose I'll have some peace. I want to get up a minute if I'm left. Wait. Oh, Jesus, wait. Yes, that thing has come on me. Yes, now, wouldn't that afflict you? Of course, all the poking and rooting and plowing he had up in me. Now what am I to do? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Wouldn't that pester the soul out of a body? Unless he likes it. Some men do. God knows there's always something wrong with us five days every three or four weeks. Usual monthly auction. Isn't it simply sickening? That night it came on me like that, the one and only time we were in a box that Michael Gunn gave him to see Mrs. Kendall and her husband at the gaiety, or something he did about insurance for him, Drimmies. I was fit to be tied, though I wouldn't give in with that gentleman of fashion staring down at me with his glasses, and him the other side of me, talking about Spinoza and his soul, that's dead, I suppose, millions of years ago. I smiled the best I could, all in a swamp, leaning forward as if I was interested, having to sit it out then to the last tag. I won't forget that wife of Scarley in a hurry, supposed to be a fast play about adultery. That idiot in the gallery hissing. The woman adulteress, he shouted. I suppose he went and had a woman in the next lane, running round all the back ways after to make up for it. 
I wish he had what I had then, he'd boo. I bet the cat itself is better off than us. Have we too much blood up in us or what? Oh, patience above, it's pouring out of me like the sea. Anyhow, he didn't make me pregnant as big as he is. I don't want to ruin the clean sheets. The clean linen I wore brought it on too. Damn it, damn it. And they always want to see a stain on the bed to know you're a virgin for them. All that's troubling them. They're such fools, too. You could be a widow or divorced forty times over. A daub of red ink would do, or blackberry juice. No, no, that's too purpley. Oh, Jamesy, let me up out of this pool. Sweets of sin. Whoever suggested that business for women? What between clothes and cooking and children? This damned old bed, too, jingling like the dickens. I suppose they could hear us away over the other side of the park that I suggested to put the quilt on the floor with the pillow under my bottom. I wonder, is it nicer in the day? I think it is. Easy. I think I'll cut all this hair off me there, scalding me. I might look like a young girl. Wouldn't he get the great suck in the next time he turned up my clothes on me? I'd give anything to see his face. Where's the chamber gone? Easy. I have a holy horror of its breaking under me after that old commode. I wonder, was I too heavy sitting on his knee? I made him sit on the easy chair purposely when I took off only my blouse and skirt first in the other room. He was so busy where he oughtn't to be, he never felt me. I hope my breath was sweet after those kissing comfits. Easy. God, I remember one time I could scout it out straight, whistling like a man almost. Easy. Oh, Lord, how noisy. I hope there are bubbles on it for a wad of money from some fella. I'll have to perfume it in the morning, don't forget. I bet he never saw a better pair of thighs than that. Look how white they are. The smoothest place is right there, between this bit here. How soft, like a peach. Easy. God, I wouldn't mind being a man and get up on a lovely woman. Oh, Lord, what a row you're making, like the Jersey Lily. Easy. Oh, how the waters come down at Lahore. Who knows, is there anything the matter with my insides, or have I something growing in me? Getting that thing like that every week. When was it last? I... Whit Monday? Yes. It's only about three weeks. I ought to go to the doctor. Only it would be like before I married him, when I had that white thing coming from me, and Floey made me go to that dry old stick Dr. Collins for women's diseases on Pembroke Road. Your vagina, he called it. I suppose that's how he got all the gilt mirrors and carpets getting round those rich ones off Stephen's Green, running up to him for every little fiddle-faddle, her vagina and her coach in China. They've money, of course, so they're all right. I wouldn't marry him, not if he was the last man in the world. Besides, there's something queer about their children always smelling around those filthy bitches all sides. Asking me if what I did had an offensive odor, what did he want me to do but the one thing? Gold, maybe? What a question. If I smathered it all over his wrinkly old face for him with all my compliment, I suppose he'd know then. And could you pass it easily? Pass what? I thought he was talking about the Rock of Gibraltar, the way he puts it. That's a very nice invention, too, by the way. Only I like letting myself down after in the hole as far as I can squeeze and pull the chain then to flush it. Nice, cool pins and needles. Still, there's something in it, I suppose. I always used to know by Millie's when she was a child whether she had worms or not. Still, all the same, paying him for that. How much is that, doctor? One guinea, please. And asking me, had I frequent omissions? Where did those old fellows get all the words they have? Omissions. With his short-sighted eyes on me, cocked sideways. I wouldn't trust him too far to give me chloroform or God knows what else. Still, I liked him when he sat down to write the thing out, frowning so severe, his nose, intelligent like that. You be damned, you lying strap. Oh, anything, no matter who, except an idiot. He was clever enough to spot that. Of course, that was all thinking of him and his mad, crazy letters, my precious one, everything connected with your glorious body, everything underlined that comes from it is a thing of beauty and of joy forever. 
something he got out of some nonsensical book that he had me always at myself four or five times a day sometimes. And I said, I hadn't. Are you sure? Oh, yes, I said, I'm quite sure, in a way that shut him up. I knew what was coming next. Only natural weakness it was. He excited me. I don't know how the first night ever we met, when I was living in Rehoboth Terrace. We stood staring at one another for about ten minutes, as if we met somewhere. I suppose on account of my being Jewish looking after my mother. He used to amuse me, the things he said, with a half-sleuthering smile on him. And all the Doyles said he was going to stand for a member of Parliament. Oh, wasn't I the born fool to believe all his blather about home rule and the land league? Sending me that long strool of a song out of the Huguenots to sing in French to be more classy. Oh, beau pays de la Touraine, that I never even sang once explaining and rigmaroling about religion and persecution. He won't let you enjoy anything naturally. Then, mighty is a great favor, the very first opportunity. He got a chance in Brighton Square, running into my bedroom, pretending the ink got on his hands to wash it off with the Albion milk and sulfur soap I used to use and the gelatin still round it. Oh, I laughed myself sick at him that day. I better not make an all-night sitting on this affair. They ought to make chambers a natural size so that the woman could sit on it properly. He kneels down to do it. I suppose there isn't in all creation another man with the habits he has. Look at the way he's sleeping at the foot of the bed. How can he, without a hard bolster? It's well he doesn't kick or he might knock all my teeth out. Breathing with his hand on his nose, like that Indian god he took me to show one wet Sunday in the museum in Kildare Street, all yellow in a pinafore, lying on his side on his hand with his ten toes sticking out, that he said was a bigger religion than the Jews and our lords both put together all over Asia. Imitating him, as he's always imitating everybody. I suppose he used to sleep at the foot of the bed, too, with his big square feet up in his wife's mouth. Damn this stinking thing, anyway. Where's this those napkins are? Ah, yes, I know. I hope the old press doesn't creak. Ah, I knew it would. He's sleeping hard. Had a good time somewhere. Still, she must have given great value for his money. Of course, he has to pay for it from her. Oh, this nuisance of a thing. I hope they'll have something better for us in the other world, tying ourselves up, God help us. That's all right for tonight. Now that lumpy old jingly bed always reminds me of old Cohen. I suppose he scratched himself in it often enough. And he thinks father bought it from Lord Napier that I used to admire when I was a little girl because I told him, easy, piano, oh, I like my bed. God, here we are as bad as ever after 16 years. How many houses were we in at all? Raymond Terrace and Ontario Terrace and Lombard Street and Hollis Street. And he goes about whistling every time we're on the run again, his Huguenots or the Frogs March, pretending to help the men with our four sticks of furniture. And then the City Arms Hotel. Worse and worse, says Warden Daly. That charming place on the landing, always somebody inside praying, then leaving all their stinks after them. Always know who was in there last. Every time we're just getting on, right, something happens, or he puts his big foot in it. Tom's and Healy's and Mr. Cuff's and Drimmy's. Either he's going to be run into prison over his old lottery tickets that was to be all our salvations, or he goes and gives impudence. We'll have him coming home with the sack soon out of the Freeman, too, like the rest, on account of those Shinner Fane or the Freemasons. Then we'll see if the little man he showed me dribbling along in the wet all by himself round by Cody's Lane will give him much consolation that he says is so capable and sincerely Irish. He is indeed, judging by the sincerity of the trousers I saw on him. Wait. There's George's church bells. Wait. Three quarters. The hour. Wait. Two o'clock. Well, that's a nice hour of the night for him to be coming home to anybody, climbing down into the area. If anybody saw him, I'll knock him off that little habit tomorrow. First I'll look at his shirt to see, or I'll see if he has that French letter still in his pocketbook. I suppose he thinks I don't know. Deceitful men. All their twenty pockets aren't enough for their lies. 
then why should we tell them, even if it's the truth they don't believe you? Then, tucked up in bed, like those babies in the aristocrat's masterpiece he brought me another time, as if we hadn't enough of that in real life without some old aristocrat or whatever his name is, disgusting you more with those rotten pictures, children with two heads and no legs. That's the kind of villainy they're always dreaming about, with not another thing in their empty heads. They ought to get slow poison, the half of them. Then tea and toast for him, buttered on both sides, and new laid eggs. I suppose I'm nothing any more. When I wouldn't let him lick me in Hollis Street one night, man, man, tyrant as ever for the one thing, he slept on the floor half the night naked, the way the Jews used when somebody dies belonged to them, and wouldn't eat any breakfast or speak a word, wanting to be petted. So I thought I stood out enough for one time and let him. He does it all wrong, too, thinking only of his own pleasure. His tongue is too flat, or I don't know what. He, he forgets that we... Then I don't... I'll make him do it again if he doesn't mind himself, and lock him down to sleep in the coal cellar with the black beetles. I wonder, was it her, Josie, off her head with my cast-offs? He's such a born liar, too. No, he'd never have the courage with a married woman. That's why he wants me and Boylan... Well, as for her, Dennis, as she calls him, that forlorn-looking spectacle, you couldn't call him a husband. Yes, it's some little bitch he's got in with. Even when I was with him, with Millie at the college races, that hornblower with the child's bonnet on the top on his knob led us into by the back way, he was throwing his sheep's eyes at those two doing skirt duty up and down. I tried to wink at him first. No use, of course. And that's the way his money goes. This is the fruits of Mr. Paddy Dignam. Yes, they were all in great style at the grand funeral in the paper Boylan brought in. If they saw a real officer's funeral, that'd be something. Reversed arms, muffled drums, the poor horse walking behind in black. L. Bloom and Tom Kernan, that drunken little barrelly man that bit his tongue off, falling down the men's W.C. drunk in some place or other. And Martin Cunningham and the two Daedaluses and Fanny McCoy's husband, white head of cabbage, skinny thing with a turn in her, in her eye, trying to sing my songs. <laughs> She'd want to be born all over again. And her old green dress, with the low neck as she can't attract them any other way, like dabbling on a rainy day. I see it all now plainly, and they call that friendship, killing and then burying one another. And they all with their wives and families at home, more especially Jack Power, keeping that barmaid. He does, of course. His wife is always sick or going to be sick or just getting better of it. And he's a good-looking man still, though he's getting a bit grey over the years. They're a nice lot, all of them. Well, they're not going to get my husband again into their clutches if I can help it. Making fun of him then behind his back, I know well, when he goes on with his idiotics because he has sense enough not to squander every penny piece he earns down their gullets and looks after his wife and family. Good for nothings. Poor Patty Dignam, all the same, I'm sorry in a way for him. What are his wife and five children going to do unless he was insured? Comical little teetotum, always stuck up in some pub corner, and her or her son waiting, Bill Bailey, won't you please come home? Her widow's weeds won't improve her appearance. They're awfully becoming, though, if you're good-looking. What men? Wasn't he? Yes, he was at the Glen Cree dinner. And Ben Dollard, bass barrel tone, the night he borrowed the swallowtail to sing out of in Hollis Street, squeezed and squashed into them and grinning all over his big dolly face like a well-whipped child's body. Didn't he look a balmy bollock, sure enough? That must have been a spectacle on the stage. Imagine paying five shillings in the preserved seats for that, to see him. And Simon Dedalus, too, he was always turning up half-screwed, singing the second verse first. The old love is the new, was one of his. So sweetly sang the maiden on the hawthorn bough. He was always on for flirtifying, too, when I sang Mar Maritana with him at Freddie Mayer's private opera. He had a delicious, glorious voice. Phoebe, dearest, goodbye, sweetheart, he always sang it. Not like Bartle Darcy, sweet tart, goodbye. Of course, he had the gift of the voice, so there was no art in it all. Over you like a warm shower bath. Oh, Maritana, wildwood flower. We sang splendidly, though it was a bit too high for my register, even transposed. 
and he was married at the time to May Goulding. But then he'd say or do something to knock the good out of it. He's a widower now. I wonder what sort is his son. He says he's an author and going to be a university professor of Italian, and I'm to take lessons. What's he driving at now, showing him my photo? It's not good of me. I ought to have got it taken in drapery. That never looks out of fashion. Still, I look young in it. I wonder he didn't make him a present of it altogether. And me, too. After all, why not? I saw him driving down to the Kingsbridge station with his father and mother. I was in mourning. That's eleven years ago now. Yes, he'd be eleven. But what was the good in going into mourning for what was neither one thing nor the other? Of course he insisted he'd go into mourning for the cat. I suppose he's a man now by this time. He was an innocent boy then, and a darling little fellow in his Lord Fauntleroy suit and curly hair like a prince on the stage when I saw him at Matt Dillon's. He liked me too, I remember. They all do. Wait. By God, yes, wait. Yes, hold on. He was on the cards this morning when I laid out the deck. Union with a young stranger, neither dark nor fair. You met before. I thought it meant him. But he's no chicken, nor a stranger either. Besides, my face was turned the other way. What was the seventh card after that? The ten of spades for a journey by land. Then there was a letter on its way, and scandals too, the three queens, and the eight of diamonds for a rise in society. Yes, wait, it all came out. And two red eights for new garments. Look at that. And didn't I dream something, too? Yes, there was something about poetry in it. I hope he hasn't long, greasy hair hanging into his eyes or standing up like a red Indian. What do they go about like that for, only getting themselves and their poetry laughed at? I always liked poetry when I was a girl. First I thought he was a poet like Byron, and not an ounce of it in his composition. I thought he was quite different. I wonder... Is he too young? He's about... Wait. Eighty-eight. I was married... Eighty-eight. Millie is fifteen yesterday. Eighty-nine. What age was he then at Dillon's? Five or six. About eighty-eight, I suppose. He's twenty or more. I'm not too old for him if he's twenty-three or twenty-four. I hope he's not that stuck-up university student sort. No. Otherwise he wouldn't go sitting down in the old kitchen with them taking Epps's cocoa and taking... Of course, he pretended to understand it all. Probably told him he was out of Trinity College. He's very young to be a professor. I hope he's not a professor like Goodwin was. He was a patent professor of John Jameson. They all write about some woman in their poetry. Well, I suppose he won't find many like me. Where softly sighs of love the light guitar. Where poetry is in the air the blue sea and the moon shining so beautifully, coming back on the night boat from Tarifa, the lighthouse at Europa Point. The guitar that fellow played was so expressive. Will I never go back there again? All new faces. Two glancing eyes a lattice hid. I'll sing that for him. They're my eyes, if he's anything of a poet. Two eyes as darkly bright as love's own star. Aren't those beautiful words? As love's young star. It'll be a change, the Lord knows, to have an intelligent person to talk to about yourself, not always listening to him and Billy Prescott's ad and Keyes's ad and Tom the Devil's ad. Then if anything goes wrong in their business, we have to suffer. I'm sure he's very distinguished. I'd like to meet a man like that. God, not those other ruck. Besides, he's young. Those fine young men I could see down in Margaret's strand bathing place from the side of the rock, standing up in the sun naked, like a god or something, and then plunging into the sea with them. Why aren't all men like that? There'd be some consolation for a woman, like that lovely little statue he bought. I could look at him all day, long curly head and his shoulders, his finger up for you to listen. There's real beauty and poetry for you. I often felt I wanted to kiss him all over. Also his lovely young cock there so simply, I wouldn't mind taking him in my mouth if nobody was looking, as if it was asking you to suck it.
so clean and white he looked with his boyish face. I would, too, in half a minute. Even if some of it went down. What, it's only like gruel or the dew. There's no danger. Besides, he'd be so clean compared with those pigs of men, I suppose, never dream of washing it from one year's end to the other, the most of them. Only that's what gives the women the moustaches. I'm sure it'll be grand if I can only get in with a handsome young poet at my age. I'll throw them the first thing in the morning till I see if the wish card comes out. Or I'll try pairing the lady herself and see if he comes out. I'll read and study all I can find, or learn a bit off by heart, if I knew who he likes, so he won't think me stupid if he thinks all women are the same. And I can teach him the other part. I'll make him feel all over him till he half faints under me. Then he'll write about me, lover and mistress, publicly too, with our two photographs in all the papers when he becomes famous. Oh, but then, what am I going to do about him, though? No, that's no way for him. Has he no manners and no refinement and no nothing in his nature, slapping us behind like that on my bottom because I didn't call him Hugh? The ignoramus that doesn't know poetry from a cabbage. That's what you get for not keeping them in their proper place, pulling off his shoes and trousers there on the chair before me so barefaced, without even asking permission, and standing out that vulgar way in the half of a shirt they wear, to be admired like a priest or a butcher or, or those old hypocrites in the time of Julius Caesar. Of course, he's right enough in his way to pass the time as a joke. Sure, you might as well be in bed with... What, with a lion? God, I'm sure he'd have something better to say for himself than old lion would. Oh, well, I suppose it's because they were so plump and tempting in my short petticoat he couldn't resist. To excite myself sometimes. It's well for men. All the amount of pleasure they get off a woman's body were so round and white for them. Always I wished I was one myself for a change, just to try with that thing they have swelling upon you so hard and at the same time so soft when you touch it. My Uncle John has a thing long, I heard those corner boys saying passing the corner of Marrowbone Lane. My Aunt Mary has a thing hairy, because it was dark and they knew a girl was passing. It didn't make me blush. Why should it either? It's only nature. And he puts his thing long into my Aunt Mary's hairy, etc., and turns out to be you put the handle in a sweeping brush. Men again all over. They can pick and choose what they please, a married woman or a fast widow or a girl for their different tastes, like those houses round behind Irish Street. No, but we are to be always chained up. They're not going to be chaining me up, no damn fear once I start, I tell you, for stupid husband's jealousy. Why can't we all remain friends over it instead of quarreling? Her husband found it out what they did together. Well, naturally. And if he did, can he undo it? He's Coronado anyway, whatever he does. And then he going to the other mad extreme about the wife in fair tyrants. Of course, the man never even cast a second thought on the husband or wife either. It's the woman he wants and he gets her. What else were we given all those desires for, I'd like to know. I can't help it if I'm young still, can I? It's a wonder I'm not an old shriveled hag before my time living with him, so cold, never embracing me except sometimes when he's asleep, the wrong end of me, not knowing, I suppose, who he has. Any man that'd kiss a woman's bottom, I'd throw my hat at him. After that, he'd kiss anything. Unnatural. Where we haven't one atom of any kind of expression in us, all of us the same, two lumps of lard. Before ever I do that to a man, for the dirty brutes, the mere thought of it is enough... I kissed the feet of you, senorita. There's some sense in that. Didn't he kiss our hall door? Yes, he did. What a madman. Nobody understands his cracked ideas but me. Still, of course, a woman wants to be embraced twenty times a day almost to make her look young, no matter by who, so long as to be in love or loved by somebody if the fellow you want isn't there. Sometimes, by the Lord God... I was thinking, would I go around by the keys there some dark evening where nobody'd know me and pick up a sailor off the sea that'd be hot on for it and not care a pin whose I was, only to do it off up in a gate somewhere? Or one of those wild-looking gypsies in Rathfarnham 
had their camp pitched near the Bloomfield Laundry to try and steal our things if they could. I only sent mine there a few times for the name, Model Laundry, sending me back over and over some old one's old stockings. That blackguard-looking fellow with the fine eyes, peeling a switch, attack me in the dark and ride me up against the wall without a word. What a murderer, anybody. What they do themselves, the fine gentlemen in their silk hats. That K.C. lives up somewhere this way, coming out of Hardwick Lane. The night he gave us the fish supper on account of winning over the boxing match. Of course, it was for me he gave it. I knew him by his gaiters and the walk. And when I turned round a minute after just to see, there was a woman after coming out of it too, some filthy prostitute. And he goes home to his wife after that. Only, I suppose the half of those sailors are rotten again with disease. I'll move over your big carcass out of that for the love of Mike. Listen to him. The winds that waft my sighs to thee so. Well, he may sleep and sigh, the great suggester Don Poldo de la Flora. If he knew how he came out on the cards this morning, he'd have something to sigh for. A dark man in some perplexity, between two sevens, too, in prison for... Lord knows what he does that I don't know. And I'm to be slooching around. We hope you are enjoying this classic book reading by Alexander Scorby. Please subscribe, like, and share the link with others. Click the playlist link in the description box below for more classic book readings. Down in the kitchen to get his lordship his breakfast while he's rolled up like a mummy. Will I indeed? Did you ever see me running? I'd just like to see myself at it. Show them attention and they treat you like dirt. I don't care what anybody says. It'd be much better for the world to be governed by the women in it. You wouldn't see women going and killing one another and slaughtering. Wouldn't you ever see women rolling around drunk like they do or gambling every penny they have and losing it on horses? Yes, because a woman, whatever she does, she knows where to stop. Sure, they wouldn't be in the world at all, only for us. They don't know what it is to be a woman and a mother. How could they? Where would they all of them be if they hadn't all a mother to look after them? What I never had. That's why I suppose he's running wild now, out at night, away from his books and studies, and not living at home on account of the usual rowy house, I suppose. Well, it's a poor case that those that have a fine son like that, they're not satisfied, and I none. Was he not able to make one? It wasn't my fault. We came together when I was watching the two dogs, up in her behind in the middle of the naked street. That disheartened me altogether. I suppose I oughtn't to have buried him in that little woolly jacket I knitted, crying as I was, but give it to some poor child. But I knew well I'd never have another. Our first death, too, it was. We were never the same since. Oh, I'm not going to think myself into the glooms about that any more. I wonder why he wouldn't stay the night. I felt all the time it was somebody strange he brought in. Instead of roving around the city meeting God knows who, night walkers and pickpockets, his poor mother wouldn't like that if she was alive, ruining himself for life, perhaps. Still, it's a lovely hour, so silent. I used to love coming home after dances, the air of the night. They have friends they can talk to, we've none. Either he wants what he won't get, or it's some woman ready to stick her knife in you. I hate that in women. No wonder they treat us the way they do. We are a dreadful lot of bitches. I suppose it's all the troubles we have makes us so snappy. I'm not like that. He could easily have slept in there on the sofa in the other room. I suppose he was as shy as a boy, he being so young, hardly twenty, of me in the next room. He'd have heard me on the chamber. Arrow, what harm? Dedalus. I wonder, it's like those names in Gibraltar, de la Paz, de la Gracia. They had the devil's queer names there, Father Vial Plana of Santa Maria that gave me the rosary, Rosales y O'Reilly in the Calle Las Siete Revueltas, and Pisimbo, and Mrs. Opiso in Governor Street. Oh, what a name. I'd go and drown myself in the first river of a name like her. 
Oh, my, and all the bits of streets, Paradise Ramp and Bedlam Ramp and Rogers Ramp and Crotchet's Ramp and the Devil's Gap Steps. Well, small blame to me if I'm a harem scarum. I know I am a bit. I declare to God I don't feel a day older than then. I wonder, could I get my tongue round any of the Spanish? Como esta usted? Muy bien, gracias. Usted? See, I haven't forgotten it all. I thought I had. Only for the grammar. A noun is the name of any person, place, or thing. Pity I never tried to read that novel cantankerous Mrs. Rubio lent me by Valera with the questions in it all upside down the two ways. I always knew we'd go away in the end. I can tell him the Spanish and he tell me the Italian. Then he'll see I'm not so ignorant. What a pity he didn't stay. I'm sure the poor fellow was dead tired and wanted a good sleep badly. I could have brought him in his breakfast in bed with a bit of toast, so long as I didn't do it on the knife for bad luck. Or if the woman was going her rounds with a watercress and something nice and tasty. There are a few olives in the kitchen he might like. I never could bear the look of them in our breenness. I could do the criada. The room looks all right since I changed it the other way. You see, something was telling me all the time. I'd have to introduce myself, not knowing me for madam. Very funny, wouldn't it? I'm his wife. Or pretend we were in Spain, with him half awake, without a god's notion where he is. Dos huevos estrellados, senor lord. The crack things come into my head sometimes. It'd be great fun supposing he stayed with us. Why not? There's the room upstairs empty, and Millie's bed in the back room. He could do his writing and studies at the table in there, for all the scribbling he does at it. And if he wants to, read in bed in the morning like me. As he's making the breakfast for one, he can make it for two. I'm sure I'm not going to take in lodgers off the street for him if he takes a gazebo of a house like this. I'd love to have a long talk with an intelligent, well-educated person. I'd have to get a nice pair of red slippers like those Turks with the fez used to sell, or yellow, and a nice semi-transparent morning gown that I badly want, or a peach blossom dressing jacket, like the one long ago in Walpole's, only eight and six, or eighteen and six. I'll just give him one more chance. I'll get up early in the morning. I'm sick of Cohen's old bed in any case. I might go over to the markets to see all the vegetables and cabbages and tomatoes and carrots and all kinds of splendid fruits all coming in lovely and fresh. Who knows who'd be the first man I'd meet? They're out looking for it in the morning, Mamie Dillon used to say. They are, in the night, too. That was her mask going. I'd love a big, juicy pear now to melt in your mouth, like when I used to be in the longing way then. I'll throw him up his eggs and tea in the moustache cup she gave him to make his mouth bigger, I suppose. He'd like my nice cream, too. I know what I'll do. I'll go about rather gay, not too much, singing a bit now and then. Mi fa pietà mazetto. Then I'll start dressing myself to go out. Presto non son più forte. I'll put on my best shift and drawers. Let him have a good eyeful out of that to make his Mickey stand for him. I'll let him know, if that's what he wanted, that his wife is fucked. Yes, and damn well fucked, too. Up to my neck, nearly. Knocked by him. Five or six times, hand-running. There's the mark of his spunk on the clean sheet. I wouldn't bother to even iron it out. That ought to satisfy him. If you don't believe me, feel my belly. Unless I made him stand there and put him into me. I have a mind to tell him every scrap and make him do it in front of me. Serve him right. It's all his own fault if I'm an adulteress, as the thing in the gallery said. Oh, much about it, if that's all the harm ever we did in this veil of tears. God knows it's not much, doesn't everybody, only they hide it. I suppose that's what a woman is supposed to be there for, or he wouldn't have made us the way he did so attractive to men. Then, if he wants to kiss my bottom, I'll drag open my drawers and bulge it right out in his face as large as life. He can stick his tongue seven miles up my hole as he's there, my brown part. Then I'll tell him I want one pound, or perhaps thirty shillings. I'll tell him I want to buy underclothes. Then, if he gives me that, well, he won't be too bad. I don't want to soak it all out of him like other women do. 
I could often have written out a fine check for myself and write his name on it for a couple of pounds. A few times he forgot to lock it up. Besides, he won't spend it. I let him do it off on me behind, provided he doesn't smear all my good drawers. Oh, I suppose that can't be helped. I'll do the indifferent. One or two questions. I'll know by the answers. When he's like that, he can't keep a thing back. I know every turn in him. I'll tighten my bottom well and let out a few smutty words. Smell rump or lick my shit or the first mad thing comes into my head. Then I'll suggest about... Yes, oh, wait now, Sonny, my turn is coming. I'll be quite gay and friendly over it. Oh, but I was forgetting this bloody pest of a thing. Phew. You wouldn't know which to laugh or cry were such a mixture of plum and apple. Now I'll have to wear the old thing so much the better. It'll be more pointed. He'll never know whether he did it or not. There, that's good enough for you. Any old thing at all, then I'll wipe him off me, just like a business, his own mission. Then I'll go out. I'll have him eyeing up at the ceiling. Where is she gone now? Make him want me. That's the only way. A quarter after. What an unearthly hour. I suppose they're just getting up in China now, combing out their pigtails for the day. We'll soon have the nuns ringing the Angelus. They'd nobody coming in to spoil their sleep except an odd priest or two for his night office. The alarm clock next door, a cock shot, clattering the brains out of itself. Let me see if I can doze off. One, two, three, four, five. What kind of flowers are those they invented? Like the stars. The wallpaper in Lombard Street was much nicer. The apron he gave me was like that something. Only I only wore it twice. Better lower this lamp and try again, so as I can get up early. I'll go to Lamb's there beside Findlater's and get them to send us some flowers to put about the place in case he brings him home tomorrow. Today, I mean... No, no, Friday's an unlucky day. First, I want to do the place up some way. The dust grows in it, I think, while I'm asleep. And we can have music and cigarettes. I can accompany him. First, I must clean the keys of the piano with milk. What'll I wear? Shall I wear a white rose? Or those fairy cakes in Lipton's. I, I love the smell of a rich big shop at seven and a half pence a pound. Or the other ones with the cherries in them and the pinky sugar, 11 pence a, a couple of pounds. Of course, a nice plant for the middle of the table. I'd get that cheaper in... Wait, where, where's this? I saw them not long ago. I love flowers. I'd love to have the whole place swimming in roses. God of heaven, there's nothing like nature. The wild mountains, then the sea and the waves rushing, then the beautiful country with fields of oats and wheat and all kinds of things, and all the fine cattle going about that would do your heart good to see, rivers and lakes and flowers, all sorts of shapes and smells and colors, springing up even out of the ditches, primroses and violets, nature it is. As for them saying there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all their learning. Why don't they go and create something, I often asked him. Atheists or whatever they call themselves. Go and wash the cobbles off themselves first. Then they go howling for the priest and they dying. And why, why? Because they're afraid of hell on account of their bad conscience. Ah, yes, I know them well. Who was the first person in the universe before there was anybody that made it all? Who? Ah, that they don't know. Neither do I, so there you are. They might as well try to stop the sun from rising tomorrow. The sun shines for you, he said, the day we were lying among the rhododendrons on Howd Head in the grey tweed suit and his straw hat, the day I got him to propose to me. Yes, first I gave him the bit of seed cake out of my mouth, and it was leap year like now. Yes, sixteen years ago, my God. After that long kiss, I near lost my breath. Yes, he said I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, so we are flowers, all a woman's body. Yes, that was one true thing he said in his life. And the sun shines for you today. Yes, that was why I liked him. Because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is. 
and I knew I could always get round him, and I gave him all the pleasure I could, leading him on till he asked me to say yes, and I wouldn't answer first, only looked out over the sea and the sky. I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of, Mulvey and Mr. Stanhope and Hester and Father and old Captain Groves and the sailors playing all birds fly and I say stoop and washing up dishes, they called it on the pier, and the sentry in front of the governor's house with a thing round his white helmet, poor devil half roasted, and the Spanish girls laughing in their shawls and their tall combs and the auctions in the morning, the Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs and the devil knows who else from all the ends of Europe, and Duke Street and the Fowl Market, all clucking outside Larby Sharon's, and the poor donkeys slipping half asleep, and the vague fellas in the cloaks asleep in the shade on the steps, and the big wheels of the carts of the bulls, and the old castle thousands of years old, Yes, and those handsome moors, all in white and turbans like kings, asking you to sit down in their little bit of a shop. And Rhonda, with the old windows of the posadas, glancing eyes a lattice hid, for her lover to kiss the iron. And the wine shops half open at night, and the castanets, and the night we missed the boat at Algeciras, the watchman going about serene with his lamp. And oh, that awful deep down torrent, oh, and the sea, the sea crimson sometimes like fire, and the glorious sunsets, and the fig trees in the Alameda gardens, yes, and all the queer little streets, and pink and blue and yellow houses, and the rose gardens, and the jessamine, and geraniums, and cactuses, and Gibraltar as a girl where I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, when I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls used. Or shall I wear a red? Yes, and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, well, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again. Yes. And then he asked me, would I? Yes to say yes, my mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts, all perfume, yes, and his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. Trieste, Zurich, Paris, 1914 to 1921. End of Ulysses by James Joyce. Narrated by Alexander Scorby. Thank you for listening to this classic book reading by Alexander Scorby on our YouTube channel. To hear more classic books, Click the playlist link in the description box below. Please subscribe, like, and share the link with others so they too can hear the Scorby Classic Book Readings.